Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here again, and I can bear witness to what Alison just said. I've been here witnessing the ILTM Asia growing from ALTM for the last 10 years all the way through to here, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, a, a year ago, I was at a conference in Seoul, and um, Mr. Modi from India was there as well, and he was talking about the future of Asia being very simply put, it must have entrepreneurship. There must be entrepreneurs to drive Asia forward. That's how Asia will become successful. And I suppose that's the sort of title of my talk today, is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, despite this slowdown that we've been seeing in the Chinese economy, everybody's been reading about it, there's a few sectors that are doing incredibly well. Wealth building and luxury travel. And I thought I'd just try and talk a little bit about some of the drivers behind why, you know, in Asia as a boom, as a still as a um, boom uh, continent, but within that, China has to be the big story. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of these uh, generation Y and some of the drivers behind all the growth that we're seeing at the moment. So, I mean, you who are traveling from all over the world to get here, um, very quickly, the China National Tourist Authority just put out the stats that we got 120 or 128 million, actually they put out two conflicting stats, of Chinese outbound travelers. Most, about 60-70% are going to Hong Kong and Taiwan, but if you take that out, you're actually still up by 10%. Um, you've got the average spend is growing, according to them, at 2,500 US dollars um, shopping spend per travel trip. And so, in that sense, you've got some really, you know, compelling numbers. But what is more exciting is if you look forward three years, the stats are, it's supposed to double. So by 2020, people are looking that these stats are supposed to double from China outbound is going to grow to 240 million. Now, I remember when we talked to five, six years ago about China outbound, perhaps even hitting as much as 100 million, we were going like, well, hey, hey, for 100 million, that's a big deal. But now we've cracked 100 million, we're on to the 200 million, right? So that's just to give you the logic, and that's why well, I suppose everybody's uh, excited to be here in Shanghai. Uh, we've got 3.1 dollar millionaires in China that we know about, and I'll go a little bit more on to that. So that just gives you the overall stats. Now, 2016 has been a really great, interesting year, and I say that because it's the first time that, if you look at the top super wealth creators, the Chinese have overtaken the US for the first time ever. We've got 568 dollar million billionaires in China, and only, or Chinese I should say, and only, I say only, 540 odd in the US. So for the first time, um, China, Chinese have overtaken the US as super wealth creators. Then the other thing, this is a big thing as well, a bombshell that we announced in uh, February, Beijing billionaires overtook New York City billionaires for the first time. So we got 100 in Beijing, we've only found 95 in New York. So in that sense, it's a real milestone year, 2016, and it's one that, you know, we're here on celebrating the 10th anniversary of ILTM Asia. You know, it's a great, it's a great topic to be aware of. So there you go, that's China overtaking the US. But there's another milestone that's been hit this year, is that Chinese make up the world's, make up 20% of the world's population. We've got 1.34 billion US dollars, um, not US dollars, I keep thinking of dollars. Uh, 1.3 billion or 4 billion people from uh, China, and that makes up 20% of the world's population. And if you look at mainland Chinese super wealth creators, we're talking the billionaire category, we've got exactly 20%. So we've hit the inflection point. All those 1,000 years of hurt, they're gone. And we, we've hit it, but if you expand the, and you look at the super wealth creators in, who are Chinese, i.e. all those first generation Chinese who moved down to Southeast Asia mainly, we're up to 30% uh, of, the, of the super wealth creators in the world are Chinese. And I just make that point, and I've broken it down here, so you've got the main and Chinese 470, Hong Kong and Taiwan as well. But I think that's a very critical thing, because the market that you're dealing with from China, and the reason you're coming to Shanghai, is you're actually dealing with the Chinese market. And I think that's something that's uh, one culture, one language. It's quite important. And then the, even to cap it all, you know, the numbers that I've given you are, are the tip of the iceberg, the ones that we can actually see. There's a whole lot of wealth out there we haven't even found. So, you know, for every one person, I mean, private bankers love playing this joke with me. They go, ah, Rupert, I know at least 10 people that should be on your list right at the top. 
I said, oh, great. You know, can you tell me who they are? But I can't tell you who they are. <laughs> they, they like to do that. Private bankers, they get kicks out of that. But anyway, so if we found $600 billionaires from China, you can bet your bottom dollar that there are another 600 that we know about. And I'm sure everybody in the travel industry, you deal with a lot of the people below the bottom of the iceberg. You, know, you probably deal with a lot of the hidden wealth as such. And just for those, the bluffers guide to China at the moment, the top three are Wang Jianling from Wanda, Li Kaixing from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, he is just Mr. Hong Kong. And then Jack Ma, and that ch photograph is uh, with uh, Xi Jinping. Jack Ma is just sort of the, pil the, the, the pin boy for um, everything that is Chinese and entrepreneurship. I actually put the photograph of Wang Jianling, his son. For those of you not familiar with Chinese culture at the moment, his son Wang Zetong is now way more famous and, and at the Generation Y level than Wang Jianling, his father. So it uh, just be uh, worth uh, being aware of that. He's, and he was educated actually in Britain as well. So um, anyway, and then just again talking about the speed of growth. And this is something that those of you have been coming over the last 10 years, and I did put in the 10 years one, so Alison can add that into her slides next year. But 10 years ago, we found $18 billionaires. You know, this is Maine and China only, right? 15 years ago, we had sort of none, effectively, one. Five years ago, we, ooh, we jumped quite quickly. And five years ago, remember, it was just a little few, couple of years after the economic crisis. And now we're on 470 and growing. So this is sort of just to give you sort of a potted history of the, of, of the, of the wealth creation that's going on. Now to get to a couple of drivers. When we talk to Chinese entrepreneurs, I meet them day in, day out. I mean, I, we track them, we're a media in China. We ask them, so, okay, so you're looking to go overseas, not for travel, but where do you want to buy a house? Right? Where are you going to buy a house? And absolutely, the, uh, the, 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 the king of the, uh, the, 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 the top country, without a shadow of a doubt, is the USA. So number one destination for buying a house or emigrating to is LA, followed by San Francisco. And look at the stats. And New York. So they are the th top three. Number four is Seattle. You know, I, they came shooting up the rankings. LA and San Francisco have been pretty consistent, number three, uh, one and two. Vancouver, Boston, they're all North American. And top 10, you've got Sydney, you've got Melbourne, you've got, um, you, you've, you've got Singapore. And actually London, and I'm British, London is actually only uh, now at number 12 or 14 or something like that. So if you're looking at where, well, the, the, one of the drivers is to where people are already going to for serious business, if you like, buying a house and, and laying down roots. Uh, that's, those, those are the stats. Then there's another one, which is a secret. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the panel after this. This is the education side. Now, for those who've been dealing with Chinese a lot, you'll understand how much Chinese absolutely uh, uh, go crazy about global education. But do you know that it's 80% of the millionaire class of China are thinking of sending their children to study overseas. 80%. I mean, Japan, by comparison, you're looking at 5%. You know, England is probably 10%. France is certainly less than 5%. Of the millionaire class in China, 80% are looking to send their children to study overseas. You are creating a whole new dynamic of, of young, of young um, you know, second generation. Actually, if you look at the emigration side, emigration, you're looking at 60% of the millionaire class in China are looking to, send, uh, to emigrate. <laughs> So, or, or thinking about it, seriously. 60% and 80%, I mean, these are stats that, again, if blow you out of the water. Compared to India, you're nowhere near these sort of stats. You know, and, and that's another big country on the up. But all this wealth, does it bring them happiness? We did a tracking of happiness. You know, you've got too much money, is it going to bring you happy? Actually, it's gone down. It was 8.2 when I first did the happiness question uh, uh, about three, four years ago. And now it's down to um, 7.8. That was a little bit down. So basically, what's driving it? The economy. It's making them have to work a bit harder, by the sounds of things. And so they're, they're working a bit harder on the economy. But life is pretty good. So on average, these people, life is pretty happy. And then I did a question here, just what is the top three happiest moments in your life? And you'll be very pleased to hear that the birth of the son and heir was now number one. And it used to be number two until last year. For the last four years, number one was always uh, you know, the birth of your company, that, that moment of entrepreneurship. That was the happiest time of my life. But right now, it is birth of one's child, okay, so that's kind of normal. Uh, marriage has just taken over at number three. It, number three used to be go to university. 
So marriage is on the up as well. So the people are becoming more family orientated here in China. So I think that's sort of one to be worth wearing of. And this stat is pretty scary. We asked, so how much do you need to be financially independent? How much is enough? And in the first tier city of China, you're looking at 29 million US dollars. Now, that was on average. We asked a group of people, and I'll tell you a bit about the survey that we did. But 29 million US dollars was considered to be enough on average. Now, if you were not there yet, so this is across everybody, rich and poor. Uh, well, not poor, but uh, millionaire class, which we count as poor. Um, and so if you're, million, if you're a mere millionaire, then the, uh, the break, you know, how much is enough is about 20 million, 19 million US dollars in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou, basically the first tier cities in China. So, uh, but if it's everybody, it's 29 million US dollars. And I just put that in because it's to do with once you've hit that barrier, you've gone through that barrier, then there's obviously a lot of bespoke travel that you can be done. And then the other one that I think is worth being aware to understand these people is health. Health, everybody is now doing jogging. Da, 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 da. You know, Wang Tianning is doing a thou, uh, you know, one hour of Wang Tianning from Wanda, the number one in China. Very proud to be able to say nowadays, I do one hour of jogging a day. And on average, these people are doing three hours of exercise a week. Now, three hours, when you actually add it all up, and I've been inspired by this, you know, it's half an hour a day. That's, that's not shabby. <laughs> On average, I mean, okay, my math isn't that good. A half an hour every day for six days a week. So jogging is the new sport of choice, and I think that's because people travel more and various other things. For women, it's yoga and swimming, but jogging is right up there for women as well. So we've just done this survey on Chinese Generation Y, luxury traveler. We did it with Marriott International. And we found that the survey that 70% of these uh, second generation um, and 70% uh, of those in the post 80s generation, so and generation Y in Chinese, you say baling holder, and are actually you know sort of are, are, are inherited their money. 30% made their money. When you go down a level, and you find that it's actually when you go to the 90s kids, you know it's 10% um, made their money, 90% inherited their money, just to give you a flavour. So you're dealing with a certain type of person, and then some of the findings that we had experienced, you know, they, they're spending a lot. So the very top end of this scale, they're spending on average 65,000 on, on tourism, of which a lot is shopping, driven by fashion and bags and, uh, and watches. It's bling bling stuff, brand stuff, rather than the, the parents who are actually spending more on local, you know, sort of, what, what do you call it, local um, color, um, you know, local souvenirs, you know. Uh, so parents are spending more on local souvenirs, but for the the, the, the young generation, the born in the 80s, they're spending it on, um, uh, you know, sort of fashion and, and luxury brands. Then the other one that we found was when we looked at the destinations of this young entrepreneurs group, or these 80s, young, young, luxury, young luxury travelers, Europe and Japan. So Europe is the absolute number one, it's the French. I'm from England, and yet the French absolutely win hands down every single year over the last 13 years. So well done, the French. Um, and over the next three years, we expect it to grow. So Europe as a destination is expected to grow. But the, the country of the moment is Japan. Country of the moment. So in terms of the most influential, the, the, the best trip I had in the last year, the, 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 where I went for Chinese New Year, it's Japan. And actually, it's a general trend that we found that these uh, young generation of luxury entrepreneurs, of luxury travelers, they are basically wanting over the next three years to go further afield and, uh, rather than closer. So Asia Pacific is less likely and further afield is more likely, including Rio and the Olympics, you know, despite the Zika um, problems that people are talking about. Some of the other ones that just very quick to summarize the findings was, um, well, travel time, they're, they're pretty flexible. They're, they're young, they haven't got that old children. So the older generation go in the summer holidays. This generation, if there's one holiday that they go to, it's the October national holiday. So bear that in mind. October national holiday, October 1st to October 10th. That is the time that they go. But for most people, it's not that time. It's actually any time of the year. No, they're flexible. They can go any time. So um, whereas the older generation, it's summer holidays, they go with their children, and October holiday is still big, and Chinese New Year. So old generation, Chinese New Year, and summer holidays, younger generation, any time of the year, and also um, uh, the uh, October holiday. They're more family-oriented, I, I think. Oh, sorry, they're more experiential-themed, looking for. So it's no longer about, I'm going to Germany to do whatever I'm going to do in Germany. It's, I'm going on a car-driving tour, and it happens to be in Germany. It's much more experiential themed. And you know, 
I'm a Brit. I don't have that many friends who've gone to the polar, who've gone to Antarctica. Um, but most, not most, many of my entrepreneur friends here in China have all been to Antarctica. So it is experiential travel. Now, this younger generation of luxury travelers, they are really looking for those sort of uh, experiential travel. Um, personalized uh, luxury services, that's in the hotel industry. You know, we've got it all in the report here. Uh, you'll, you'll all get, get one, or it's all online if you want it. Um, but just be aware that they demand a lot more personalized services. I think everybody knows about that. We'll talk about that. And then WeChat. It's WeChat, WeChat, WeChat. Uh, Alison just said you look at your phone 85 times. Uh, we can t I can add on to that. 260 minutes a day is what people spend on WeChat at the moment. 260 minutes a day. So if you're not on WeChat, on WeChat, then you, you jolly well should be. And, and finally, stars. And, you know, this is where we were 20 years ago. Jackie Chan and Dong Li Jun. Now, anybody in the Chinese, Chinese in the audience, you all know who I'm talking about, unless you're born in the 90s, in which case you've got absolutely no idea who I'm talking about. And, and then on the right, you've got Angela Baby, this, this Shanghainese um, uh, star, and then Chris Wu, uh, who, 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 you know, I mean, to hire them to come to a show or to a gig was going to cost you, you know, millions of renminbi, if not close to a million US dollars once, once. They are the new inspiration. And I put the lady in the middle is the wife of Xi Jinping, Peng, Li, Peng Liyuan. And she's actually very much become a sort of a, a, a media star in her own right. Whatever she wears, wherever she goes, whatever she does is being tracked by loads of media. So ladies and gentlemen, my time's up. I just wanted to give you a very quick idea as to you seeing there's a slowdown in the economy, but really weirdly, there's all this growth coming out. And it's being driven by, in luxury travelers, being driven by these young luxury travelers. So, Wish you best of luck for this week. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.